Good evening, everybody. So thank you so much for watching. My guests tonight are the entire Stiletto Brass. Uh, Stiletto Brass was formed in 2010, and as a uh, they rolled out of the International Women's Brass Conference, and we'll talk about the forming of this group. Uh, but before we go any further, I'll introduce the group: uh, Amy Gilreath, uh, trumpet; Susan, Hi. Jack, Natalie Mannix, trombone; Rachel Hockenberry, horn; and Velvet Brown on tuba. So, ladies, thank you so much for being with me tonight. I appreciate that. Um, so I thought the first thing we would do is, is uh, talk about some of you as individuals and some of your background, <laughs> and then we'll kind of ask some, some general brass quintet questions. So, uh, but Natalie, I thought I'd start with you. Uh, Natalie Mannix is, of course, the professor of trombone at the University of North Texas, and before that was at Towson State. And before that was in the uh, Navy Band in, in Washington, D.C. And is a graduate of the University of Michigan and the Juilliard School and uh, has a doctoral degree from Catholic University. So Natalie, thanks so much for being on. Um, can you talk about uh, your early beginnings playing the trombone? I actually started in sixth grade. Um, in fifth grade, I played the clarinet and it was terrible, but I knew I really liked music. And um, we got to choose a different instrument if we wanted to when we went into sixth grade. And I was having trouble making a decision. And then my mom just said offhanded, why don't you pick the trombone? That's cool. And so I said, okay. And that was really the only reason I picked the trombone. And uh, my band director was really excited because we needed more trombones. And she gave me an instrument and said, here you go. You're signed up. <laughs> now, where did you grow up? Where was this? I grew up outside of Detroit, okay. Michigan. Yeah. And um, great public school music education. It was a really great experience. We had the same band director from fifth through 12th grade. And she was a really amazing woman. Um, both like in the classroom and out of the classroom. So that was a really great role model for me. That's awesome. Were you, were you taking lessons at an early age? Yeah, I started almost immediately. Um, again, my mom, I said to my mom, I want to take private lessons. And she was so excited that I finally liked doing something because <laughs> she had right. trouble keeping me interested in any activity. I would last a couple months and move on. And this was the first thing I really showed interest in. And so she was very supportive and signed me up. Um, I took lessons with Andy James at the Royal Music Center in Royal Oak, Michigan. And he's still, he's a great freelancer in the Detroit area. And it was, you know, a great experience. Wow. And so, and then of course you went to University of Michigan. There's a lot mm -hmm. of Big Ten representation in this room right now. <laughs> um, so talk a little bit about your studies with, uh, with Dennis Smith at U of M. Oh, he was so nurturing and amazing and nice. He was like, a father figure, a grandfather figure. He was just so supportive. I, I went through a, a stage where I wasn't sure if I wanted to do music. Um, and so I did pre-med as well as music as a backup plan. And so I was kind of torn in two different directions and he recognized that. So probably didn't push me very hard, was just very encouraging. And then um, the day I decided to go into music finally my senior year, he was like, okay, you have to do this, 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 in this order every day. And it was like game on from then on. But up until then, he was just really supportive and nice and so a very you, so beautiful you, sound. Like that's still my sound image I have to this day. Wow. So so you really didn't know that you wanted to do this for sure until you were a senior in college, though. Yeah, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't fathom the idea that I could make a living doing it. It was really scary to me and uncertain and how was I going to support myself and what was I going to be happiest with 10 years from now and then that was the moment where a friend of mine at Music Academy of the West where I went that summer said well why don't you just keep doing what makes you happiest now then you'll be happiest 10 years from now <laughs> and I was like whoa that's brilliant I'm going to do that and that was definitely music so after, at, from then on I was I was sold on it so so when you had that shift of deciding that that's what you were going to do um, how did your schedule change and your practice habits change? And did things well, I dropped, happen? dropped my anatomy class and, um, decided to just take a lot less classwork my last year in practice for my senior recital and my grad school auditions. And 
I still was not a great practicer. I think like I still just tried to get two hours a day. I was always really efficient and I had done a lot of work at a younger age to work on my fundamentals so I could get away with a little bit of less practice maybe. But um, yeah, two, two hours a day. And if I was lucky, maybe a three hour day occasionally on a Sunday, but it wasn't great. Like I, I definitely think my students should do more. <laughs> so, but it, it worked out and um, I really just focused that last, I would say semester and a half, especially on auditions for grad school and yeah, things like concerto competition and senior recital. And of course, that clearly worked out because you went to Juilliard and you studied with Joe Alessi. Yeah. So how did you, how did your playing change from Michigan through Juilliard with Joe? Um, it was just, um, I guess it was more regimented, and Joe has a great concept of which fundamentals are going to help you improve each issue you might have as a player. He worked a lot with um, efficiency of embouchure and producing an ease of sound and projection of sound and in that orchestral development that I might not have had the most of up until then. And it was a lot of urbans and fundamentals and exercises. And he was saying, he always said at the beginning um, that he didn't want us to take auditions right away. We first needed to learn how to play the trombone. And so that was his focus. He, he really wanted us to get to a certain level before we went out and distracted ourselves with audition preparation. Did, so do you remember some of that audition preparation you had for the Navy band? Cause of... Yes, I was already out of school and I was freelancing and teaching privately. Um, so I had a little bit more time on my hands. I had just started my doctorate at Rutgers, actually, and um, the band excerpts were all really new to me, and so I had to listen to a lot of recordings, and it wasn't easy to get recordings then. Like, we still had to go out and find the physical CDs <laughs> yeah. and dating myself, but for the most part, that's true at, even then, and... Um, so I, I had to go find physical copies of all these marches and tried to find ones of the Navy band performing them too so I would know what style. And a couple really like obscure pieces like Bum's Rush was one of the pieces I remember. Hard, find, it was so hard to find a recording and then I finally was able to get that. So I played a lot along with those recordings in order to get the band style down. And then there were some standard orchestral excerpts too that I had already been working on. You know, I was going to... I was going to ask Susan this too, but it, you might want to hear your answer to this too. I know that like if we're in school and we're always working on orchestral excerpts and then you have a band list, it's like actually you feel, it feels better because it's you don't have the ingrained yeah. habits you have from some of like how many ways can I screw up Petrushka or, right. you know, because there's a lot of ways <laughs> that I can do that. Yeah. Um, so, so talk about your development in the band and, and kind of, bridging that gap and doing and doing the doctorate at Catholic. Yeah, the band it was a it was a great job. I'm really grateful for it. That's the best colleagues trombone players I've ever played with in one section. And these people went on to get jobs in the Atlanta Symphony, the Tone Hall Orchestra in Switzerland, and I would say four or five people went on to play professionally um, right after we all played together. So it was an amazing experience. Um, I got so much better just playing with these people, and we'd get together and play excerpts and help each other prepare for auditions while we were in the band for orchestral jobs, and that's when I won the Delaware Symphony job, actually. It was really important, um, always playing for people and getting together and still immersing yourself in that training. We weren't going to be the people that got the job and then stopped practicing. You know, we really still had ambitions. We wanted to do as much as we can orchestrally. So that was great, and the freelance scene in D.C. was great. I um, got to sub in the National Symphony with my teacher, Milt Stevens, which was wonderful. Um, so still improving and working on playing the entire time I was in the band. Um, and then eventually I just decided, um, I don't know, maybe I, I had a hard time not passing out in the heat. <laughs> so there were several embarrassing moments where I was playing a full honors funeral or a retirement ceremony standing at attention where I, you know, just what did one of those numbers and it really got stressful for me because then once that happens to you you start thinking about it and talking yourself into this <laughs> and so almost every ceremony in the heat i go am i sick am i gonna pass out 
oh my God, I'm going to pass out. And then like, it, it was just crazy. And so it was not relaxing, but um, I still love playing in the band and on stage. I just had trouble with some of the ceremonies. So I thought, yeah, maybe I'll continue my doctoral degree and just see if teaching is more, you know, more just my style. So I finished my doctorate while I was in the Navy band and started applying for some college teaching jobs and was lucky enough to get one pretty much in the back door in Baltimore at Towson. So that worked out really well because I could transition to that job and not move or lose any of my freelancing. And yeah, so it worked out very well, actually. I was so lucky. you must have been in the band with Nate Zagans, right? I was, yeah. Yes, because Nate is my neighbor, sort of, like about oh. five minutes that way. So, oh, wow, yeah. Um, yeah. And you've probably seen his son, Jason, was a, is a national celebrity now because of... Speaker, you know, yes. A trumpet player, stuff. yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that's a, that must have been a pretty motivated group of, of trombone players. Yeah, um, incredible. How much of that's carried into your... Uh, that kind of culture is cultivated into your studio at North Texas? Well, uh, we have... <laughs> so we first make sure that everyone's a good person, and that's really a big primary goal of our studio at UNT and we have a no jerk rule <laughs> and we just make sure that everybody is really supportive of each other, helping each other audition, getting together in sections to prepare for any auditions, not being competitive and cutthroat and playing mind games with other people. So we hope we catch any sort of flare ups that might happen in a studio of 70 and we discuss these problems that might come up with people and make sure we nip it in the bud before it really gets out of control. And sometimes people are just don't even know how they're coming off to other people. That's not like it's intentional, but they just might be rubbing people the wrong way. But for the most part, we have a really great group of kids that get along really well. Kids, I say kids, some of them are in their 40s. But <laughs> um, yeah, and it's a really great culture. I, I feel like we do a really good job trying to keep it a family, even though it's really big. Right, right. That's, that's something I, I think people don't understand sometimes as they're coming into audition for school is how important it is to be nice and, you know, I mean, as a trumpet player, there's no way we could ever assume that. So, um, <laughs> so, um, that's awesome. And, and I just wanted to mention, uh, you know, I love your, the CD breaking ground It's a CD of all women composers. I mean, and, uh, Susan Mutter. Uh, and Guy Fools, Amy Reeves Mills, and Lauren Bernofsky, of course, who everybody loves her work, and Dorothy Gates. And if people can get on iTunes and check it out, it's excellent. Thanks. It's really great music making. Great composers. Um, and and uh, Velvet, I want to come to you next hey. as a senior member of the group. Oh, a, oh. Not, a senior, not senior in age, senior in wisdom. <laughs> not, not that at all. It was not a dig. But I do remember, I do remember when I was a much younger player, seeing your CDs out and, and having a real awareness of who you were, you know, right away. And that there were, because you were making solo tuba recordings before a lot of people, you know. Mm -hmm. And can you can you talk about some of those recordings on the, the those are Crystal Records label, right? Yes. Um, yes. So my first CD uh, was made in 1999, I believe. And um, that was uh, uh, just a wonderful experience. I was uh, um, I actually prepared for that CD um, in Italy the summer before um, the summer that it was made. So I just launched myself there and I uh, worked with um, Roger Bobo. My pianist was also um, Italian. And so we would get together and play concerts and just immerse ourselves into the music that we were going to record. Um, we recorded it outside of uh, Florence in uh, a very, very old, old church without air conditioning. And it was extremely hot, hotter than people have ever really, um, uh, had before. And, um, but, uh, we, we really enjoyed it. How can you not enjoy um, recording and then eating, recording and eating, and then just the uh, the the Tuscany um, countryside. So that first CD um, happened in '99, um, and that was right around. I mean, everybody has a thought about: Are they doing the? Um, are they in the career that they 
want to want to be in. And um, just I don't know. Recently, uh, not before that, I spoke to my mom and I said, I, I'm not sure. I think I want to um, just have a restaurant and and be a chef and so forth. And um, I think the other thing was all of the practice, you know, for the, I was teaching at Bowling Green State University and all of the practice, so I have some quintet things and, you know, you prepare for the once a year um, recital and maybe a, um, a school here and there, but it wasn't, it wasn't enough. I needed to express myself even more. So um, I set out to make um, a recording and, um, I didn't know a lot of um, the pieces um, uh, that were being written or newer or, or things. And so Roger helped with that and um, onward we went. And that was the first, uh, first CD. And it did change um, a perspective a bit. Uh, of course, you know, there were, there are all the wonderful Roger Bobo CDs and other CDs that were, were made, but um, it changed, it changed the perspective. And I think, um, it um, started to really highlight solo tuba playing by just regular people, <laughs> you know, because right. you know, Roger was a celebrity, but just by regular people. And um, it, was, it was a good time to, um, to do that. Because so. kind of before some of your recordings, there would have been uh, uh, Mr. Phillips, probably right. Mm -hmm. Dan Parentoni would have done some. Bobo would have done his, of course, like you mentioned, and mm -hmm. uh, and then Sam Palafian would have done. Sam Palafian and um, um, uh, the, Jeff Funderburk, uh, that was out in Iowa, had done a recording. Um, it, uh, it, around that same time, Oyston Botsvik um, put out his first recording. Um, and um, of course, there was... Um, there were some, just some other other recordings. Sorry, names are escaping me now. But there were some. James Gourlay was recording, um, but it was it was it was a good time to come in and uh, have some fresh music. Some things I had done um, re repeated from someone else, but the, really the good time to have some fresh music. And and uh, and speaking of all those names we talked about, I mean, uh, Sam Palafian would have been an influence on you as well, right? Yes. In your video. Definitely. Can you kind of talk about Sam and, and, and what he meant to you and, and personally and, and then the rest of the tuba world? Uh, yes, uh, Sam, I, I studied with Sam at Boston University and uh, for my master's. And Sam was an a absolute uh, major, major influence. Um, number one, I just could not figure out how some would, someone could do all of the things that, that he could do on the instrument and make it look and sound easy um, and um, to have a lot of uh, fun doing it. You know, he was very, very supportive um, and was always saying um, that, especially with the solo work, he said, you know, you have, you have something that is just so unique. You've got to develop that, develop that more. And so he kind of put the bug in my ear at, at that time um, as well. And then also during the time of studying um, at Boston University, Empire Brass, the Empire Brass Symposium, or, or um, uh, we all went through um, uh, all the brass players, a rigorous um, br um, brass quintet um, study. And that was great. I mean, how just going to rehearsals or listening to Empire, and um, I, I can't think of a, of a better way to have spent those those years, just having the the fire, um, having a fire under me the the whole time, um, and you're you're in school, but you're out there being a professional. There's there the quintet, um, the quintet um, scene was just absolutely incredible, and that's where Boston Brass started, and um, and I'm a founding member of Boston Brass, and so um, just just a delightful, um, delightful. Everyone was very upset, uh, that, to say the least, with uh, Sam's passing because he had answers to everything. He right. knew how to answer um, a, a question, whether it was about 
something with playing or um, how to um, get along more with uh, with with people and you know he started the um, the, the studio was uh, filled with with uh, folks all really trying to um, uh, move forward and so forth but no one really stepped on anyone's toes we were we were supportive we shared rooms and had you know had our assigned rooms and it was just um, a very very good atmosphere and was there any, supportive was there any like uh, really sage advice that you always transfer to students that Sam said that really sticks out or over top of anything else it's kind of funny because um, I'm a, I don't have one one thing um, uh, for sure, but I would say during every lesson there is something that I will say, and I will it it'll ding to me that I'm repeating Sam here. How cool, you know? And so yeah. I don't have anything uh, specific because he's always surrounding me just uh and um whether or not with the energy you know yeah. um uh and i just motivate i know i remember I, um the day after he um, passed away i was down in south carolina soloing with the um greenville um symphony and the encore that i played was an unaccompanied encore um happy blues i think it was called it was originally for a French horn, uh, for horn, um, and I just take it, take it, and do my thing with it. And um, there were just some things, and I'm thinking, what's going on here? This is so cool. Am I really playing this, or you know, just I had just just such a homage to to Sam, and it was for him. And I think. It, some things came out that I didn't practice, but it was, I was just so motivated um, to say thank you. And that was the time to do it. And um, so he's all, he's always motivating. And um, yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, people like yourself and some of the other tuba players we've mentioned have really changed what's expected of the tuba and what's, what's possible with the tuba. But of course, you've also had a lot of orchestra experience well, uh, playing in Finland. You subbed a lot with the Detroit Symphony. Can you talk a little bit about the time, in, uh, especially with Detroit, and, and when that was in your career and kind of how some of that subbing came about? Uh, well, let's see, I was living in Bowling Green and, um, and the, um, uh, Wes Jacobs was the, the tuba player. And I was, of course, you know, this was still early in, in my career. And um, there was something that I came to understand, or it was just what we thought as students, that you have to be in an orchestra or you have to be in a full-time brass quintet and that deems your success, okay? So for, um, here I am, I'm teaching and successful in my teaching, but I didn't have those things that that we were we I think mostly as students um, mm -hmm. uh, put on ourselves. Um, so there was, well, here's Wes Jacobs, exactly 100 miles from my door to his door, um, and I could go and study with him. So I started, you know, to to study with him, and um, as I said, I was already uh, teaching and and so forth, and. Uh, when he couldn't make um, some of the uh, orchestra um, concerts, then um, then I was <clears> on the, the sub list. I think it began with the Nutcracker, as it sometimes always always does. And then um, there's some other things um, there. But one of the most amazing um, experiences was, was I mean, we did this um, Gone with the Wind um, orchestral and um, video um, extravaganza and um, it was basically the whole the whole time it was the horn section against me I was so exhausted <laughs> like enough enough I don't have another one in me no. <laughs> but it was just it was it was so exciting it was 
oh my goodness. Um, and then of course you have the fire scene behind you and that, that was, um, that was, that was showing and it was just, um, uh, really ex 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 exciting. It was a, that particular one was a two day and Randy and Randy Haas, who's based Ramon is there and I showed up, you know, Sunday for the next concert and we're like, Oh, do we have any more to give? Um, <laughs> but it was just, it was really exciting. But, um, um, I had a really, really some good experience, very good, excellent experiences, um, playing, playing there. Um, Wes was, uh, busy and, um, sometimes with, uh, some other things. And, um, so I had to, I got to drive up there and, and, and play. So it was wonderful. So, you know, talking about the orchestral thing and the, the soloing and now the teaching, uh, I would imagine since the time you were a student, the uh, amount of opportunities for tuba players have, I mean, I don't want to say they our opportunities have grown as musicians in general because they haven't, but the amount of uh, roles that the tuba can play has changed quite a bit. So is there a way that, uh, you know, because we were talking about it earlier, the stereotype of you have to be in a quintet that's full time, which how many of them are there? And orchestras, and of course, there's only one tuba. Um, so in what ways have, have you as a teacher kind of approached your students about all the other career possibilities that have evolved in the past 15 to 20 years? Well, I think uh, one of the things that I, I do all the time is that, um, w well, with us having one spot in an orchestra, we can't all assume that, that the, the students that are performance um, uh, have, or have performance as their goals, we can't assume we're going to uh, just have that one one job. And I recall, too, that in the years right after grad school and so forth and so on, there was probably two, there were probably two auditions in, that I could have taken. Um, yeah. And then, a, a, oops! And then after a while, I just really enjoyed the life that I that I had, and um, it wasn't of interest um, anymore as a full time um, option. But the students, um, what I say to them, and what I try to teach them or help them realize is that they have to be great tuba players. And as as, as Natalie said knowing the nuts and bolts of playing the instrument. And then you can play, then you can play anything. Let's, um, to, to, to know the nuts and bolts. Uh, another thing based on the fact that um, I do play in so many uh, genres from um, Fat Bottom Girls is a group <laughs> that I play in. It's a rock, rock, um, folk, um, jazz, a band where the uh, it's it's led by Nitra Johnson, who is Howard Johnson's daughter, and um, she's a vocalist and singer and songwriter, and she grew up knowing all about Gravity. So she wants a band. What is what's her instrumentation going to be? What's her dream instrumentation? Tubas. And so um, for the last twenty years, I've led that group um, as as tuba players, and um, that is awesome and freeing and you never know what you're what you're what you're gonna have to what you're gonna have to do i mean dancing and tuba it's just amazing but for so from there and then there's the jazz um part with me playing since 2003 with um a lead ensemble for howard johnson's band um and um then brass quintet and then orchestra and then of course i like the solo so um and then there's got to be more, I say to my students. So how, what are you going to do to change this um, and enhance? The future is you right now. So what are you going to do? And so um, I had a student that led um, a very successful brass band, you know, and I always thought I'm going to be so, I will feel that I've done, done a great job of teaching when I have a student that's the leader of um, like a brass band or something, you know. And so I, I put those as equal orchestra and leader, you know, playing this great music um, and leading leading their own band and touring and so forth and so on. Um, so those are the examples I've I've had going on for um, many years. 
um, yeah. and it's gonna it's gonna continue. And then students come to find me that like, well, I love jazz. I want to do this. I also I want to I want to get an indie group. You know where the tuba's in an indie group and da 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 and it's like bring it on let's do it i can help you get those get those um going we learn to play and then you can and i will we have all of those focus points in mind to make sure that you develop the skills to 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 realize to realize your goals so there's 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 no shortcut to learning to play the horn yeah but there's um the the vision for what they want to do with their instrument and me charging them with the fact that the future of music, the future of tuba is where they go. So take what I give you, add your own and make it better. Excellent, great. Um, and and uh, so thank you Velvet for that. I'm just kind of smoothly transitioning because I don't have any kind of uh, whoosh, go <laughs> <laughs> but uh amy i want to talk to you next but i forgot the the uh the nc17 rating on the poster so i'm just kidding so um <laughs> amy i've known you for a long time and of course amy gilreath uh just recently retired as professor from illinois state university uh and he is the principal trumpet at illinois symphony orchestra and the illinois chamber orchestra symphony to camera she played uh, sub with St. Louis Symphony and runs a, a great brass festival in Orvieto, Italy. Orvieto. Orvieto. <laughs> yeah, uh, Chef Guardio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also you've been a, a member of Dallas Brass and the Velvet Brass, and we'll talk about the, the Velvet Brass in a little bit. But I wonder if you would kind of give your background a little bit, because you and I, as we speak often, and uh, you were talking to me about when you started, uh, were you the only trump trumpet player in your trumpet section as a female? Yes, yes. So I started um, in fourth grade, and um, I actually had um, discovered my mom's cornet. She uh, was a... Um, a pioneer being a, a woman trumpet or uh, cornet player in band in the fifties. And she decided to play cornet. And um, so I, I discovered her um, cornet and picked it out. My mom had recordings of Harry James and uh, Herb Albert. And my, my grandmother loved Harry James. That's where those records came from. And I would just, I fell in love with it. And so when fourth grade came around, I decided I was going to be a trumpet player. And it turns out that small world music world that my new band director who came in that year was, had been in the trumpet cornet section with my mother in high school. They had been classmates and sat beside each other through band. And he was my, my new band director. His name was Carl Zimmerman. And, uh, he, um, he was an amazing band director. I mean, when I think back on his time, uh, he was my trumpet teacher from the time I started from fourth grade until I left for college. Um, and I was kind of his project because he knew my mother. So there was this whole, you know, and they had this competition thing when they were in school together. And so it, he was just really thrilled to have me as a student, you know, um, but um, he was such an amazing educator that, through my time in school, he had first chair players, Tennessee, all state first chair players on every instrument. And he was the private instructor for all of those people. He taught everything. It was just truly amazing. I mean, Principal Bassoon was one of his students. So um, he was he was really amazing. And, you know, he talked to me from the very beginning about playing with a beautiful sound and uh, and we would listen to recordings and he's the one that that uh, you know gave me my first Maurice Andre recording and um, I went to I was going to be a veterinarian that was my that was my dream job and then I went to a music camp is called Stephen Collins Foster Music Camp in Kentucky and uh, it was it was a month-long camp and uh, I came back and announced to my parents I wanted to be a trumpet professional trumpet player so 
That's how that went over. That went over. Yeah. Great. It was a great <laughs> moment at my house. <laughs> Did they say, uh-huh? Uh, uh, yeah, we- right. Well, he actually, Mr. Zimmerman tried to talk me out of it. And, um, and, but when he saw that I was, that I had made my mind up that that's what I wanted to do, he goes, okay, well then let's go. So then like Natalie was talking, my practice habits all changed. You know, I was putting in three hours a day and just was, this is what I wanted to do. And he said, well, then you need to do X, Y, and Z. And, and I was like, okay. So, um, so, and he, he started I mean, you were in fourth grade. Do you remember what kind of, were you learning scales and Clark studies in fourth grade? Were you kind of advanced like that or? Scales. I was doing scales. Um, he had me in the Goldman book, Fundamentals of Pl- Trumpet Playing was my first little book. And then went on to Arben. Um, he, he was one of these that he knew how to push my buttons. So he would, he would put something in front of me and say, well, I know you probably can't play this, but let's give it a shot. And I'd be like, give me that, you know, and I would practice like crazy and come back the next week. And, you know, I didn't know at the time it, he just kept pushing the button. You know, he was giving me Charlie A's, you know, when I was in high school. And well, I know it's probably going to be over your head, but, you know, <laughs> so, <Nice>. yeah. <laughs> nice. And you, and you had somebody named Jeff Bailey, I think, in your band, too. Is that right? Correct. Jeff was in my band. I, I, would, I got really bored in junior high, so they put me in the high school band in seventh grade. And so Jeff Bailey, who's principal with Nashville Symphony, was sitting principal. Oh, by the way, we'll keep talking. But there's a guest. There's a guest? Mm-hmm. The guest is connected to the audience. Very special guest. Uh oh. <laughs> Did a prank call before in my life. On your camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The camera. Uh oh, there's a phone call. I'll do this. We'll keep talking until she figures it out. Okay. <laughs> so I went to Eastern Kentucky University. Um, I actually played in the faculty brass quintet there. That's, that was the start of my brass quintet um, and falling in love with that repertoire. Um, yep. And then went on to University of Illinois for grad school, had a graduate brass quintet there. Um, and then when I got the job at Illinois State University, they had a faculty brass quintet that had been going since the 70s. And uh, I, I became a, part, a member of that, um, actually. And then, so I've been in a brass quintet for, for years. And, and uh, speaking of your education, I, de- I definitely wanted to talk about two gentlemen that are very uh, near, dear to you, Mike Tunnel and Ray Sasaki. What if you might talk about them? New voice. New voice. New voice. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute you for just a second. Okay. <laughs> Yes, um, I studied with Mike Tunnel for my uh, master's, and um, Mike was one of the most amazing piccolo trumpet players I think I have ever heard. I mean, he was just something else, and uh, um, I re- you know, remember in his lessons and just him teaching me about, about trumpet and, and about piccolo and um, just the different... Um, tricks that he, that he learned as a player. We became very close. I, um, with his family and I, you know, this, this kid with his kids and his wife, Mimi became my pianist. She was actually my pianist when I did the first Ellsworth Smith competition. And, and so, um, yeah, they were, they were very close. And while I was, um, teaching at ISU, my sabbatical, um, it turned out, um, Mike had become ill. And so I was um, teaching down there once a, once a month during my sabbatical and staying with them and spending a lot of time with Mike and, yeah. and with Mamie. So that was a real special time for, for me um, to do that. Ray, um, Ray was great. Ray taught me about relaxing and just going with the flow with the music. And, and um, I, I'll never forget Ray. Um, I, I was ready to, to go with, um, some hard concerto. I think it was maybe R tuning or something. That was going to be my first trumpet lesson with him for my doctoral degree. And uh, 
I started to play some in, in races. You know, Amy, let's let's before before you play that, let's let's just do something else. And he pulls out the Arbins and it's page one with the whole notes. He goes, play, play that one. And I played and I'd get to the third bar and he goes, yeah, but that articulation wasn't the same as the other two. Go back to the beginning. Well, so, you, didn't, you didn't take the, so that wasn't the same kind of sound as you had to go back to the beginning. I was, it was a big piece of humble pie. And I went, I understand. <laughs> I left my, my uh, lesson just furious with myself about you can practice as many Tomasis and Artinians you want to, but don't forget the fundamentals. So I, uh, yeah, I never forgot my fundamentals and I still practice the first page of Arbin still to this day. <laughs> Did you ever spend 30 minutes on the first three notes of Petrushka? Oh. <laughs> Cause I did. Did you? <laughs> Somebody is on the screen right now. <laughs> hey, Marie. How you doing Marie? Marie? Marie, hit unmute there. Let's unmute you there. Oh, okay. Hey, Marie. Well, we can't quite hear you yet, which is unusual. <laughs> there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, <laughs> can. can we? Hey. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi, Marie. Did you see all your smiling faces? Here's two. Here's two. Yeah, where's Miss Velvet? Did she bag this bag on this one? No, she's oh, not she's there. there. Where? So I'm probably on the edge. Oh, yeah. there you are. <laughs> Hi, Velvet Gina. Hi. Go, Velvet. Go, Velvet. <laughs> now, Mark, so now, you're getting all the inside secrets of a, a women's brass group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm informed. <laughs> so, hey, Marie, I'll tell you what, I'm going to, I'll finish up with Amy and, and Susan, Rachel real quick. And I want to circle back around to you in a minute and talk about. No, Amy. this is there. No, I'm just here to. Okay. Well, all right. Well, every once in a while, I'll ask you about chili or something and we'll I'll come back to you. <laughs> graders. Let's make it graders. Graders sounds graders. perfect. Perfect. There you go. Rachel knows. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, Amy, before, before we move on, I, I think, um, well, I mean, yeah, you're talking about all those pieces and, and playing fundamentals is all such good information. Uh, but you did some extra study in, uh, well, first of all, I think it's very cool. You're, I love your dissertation on all the Russian music. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, that was a big passion of mine. Now, and, and uh, did that come about when you were working on the Ellsworth Smith stuff? Or how did that, how did you kind of step into that? <laughs> No, at the time, um, I, I love the Russian composers and I had um, been working on Artunian. I actually was the first student to ever solo with the University of Illinois Symphonic Band. They'd never had a student solo with the group and we did the Artunian and it was the Guy Duker arrangement. And of course, that, Guy Duker has a University of Illinois connection as well. So um, at the time for me, you know, it was only... Artunian and Pac Mantova. So I thought, well, you know, this would be a really good thing to do for my doctoral research paper. Um, so at the time, of course, there was no email or anything. And we had the ITG book that you look through and, and I found some Russian names um, in there and I contacted people by snail mail and asked that I wanted to do my research on finding more and introducing um, at the time, it was called, you know, Soviet Union trumpet concertos to the United States. And I had um, Anatoly Selyanin at the Saratov Conservatory uh, graciously agreed to help me. And I had a few other people. I had contacted um, uh, Nikolai Berdyev, and not knowing that he had passed away, but his widow uh, got back to me and said, oh, he would love that you were doing this. And so it took me two years of back and forth snail mail to get enough pieces um, and then ended up doing this, this doctoral research paper on, on introducing all these works to the United States. And, and you did, when did you do Ellsworth Smith? Ellsworth Smith was the very first one. So that would have been 88. And who won that? Terry Everson. Was it rigged? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that that was a yeah, that was a a, a tough one. I had to do um, in the morning, um, and it was um, first round. It was in Ohio, so um, I drew the short straw. So I was at eight a.m. Started out with the Telemann concerto, and then you had to go off stage from Telemann and pick up the B flat and do Hindemith right after uh, that. And then the the second round was during the. In the, in the afternoon, I did Tomasi. Was that in Columbus? That was in Columbus, yeah. That, you know, I was uh, I was actually in the area while this competition was being held. And, really? <laughs> yeah, and I had no clue. I mean, back in those days, you know, we didn't have internet or anything. That, right. So, and I'm sitting in, a, in an orchestra. Who who knows about the Ellsworth Smith competition? You know, right. I get there, hear all these trumpet players warming up. It's like... Good God, who are these people? You yeah, know? so yeah, I had um, Crispian Steel Perkins was a judge, and um, Dave Hickman um, was a judge. Who? Dave Hickman, <laughs> yeah, who? And Yen was a competitor too, right? I'm sorry. And was Yen Lindemann was in that competition too? Is that right? No, he was in the next one that I was in. That happened at at Florida State. Okay. I was a I was a semifinalist in the second one. I had already gotten the job at ISU and and you know put my name in on that one as well. So I, I made semis for that. So that's where I met Yens, and he won that one. Yens won that one. Do you think that was rigged? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was robbed, right? You know. <laughs> it, was a, it was a riot after. So. Geez, I wish I. I wish I would have known you were competing. I could have met you a decade before I did. <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, the beauty about having a, a university job was I got to take a sabbatical and I went to Bordeaux and studied with Pierre Duteau um, and um, got to study and, and be there and and, uh, and and show them your 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 special present. Yes. So, so um, I'd always told Pierre that, you know, one of the reasons why I played the trumpet was because of listening to Maurice Andre. And I said, you know, I've never met him. And um, little did Pierre know that when he said, Hey, you should, you need to come back and I'll, I'll work this out so that maybe we can go see him. And I did, I actually flew back then for spring break and uh, went to Maurice Andre's home and we hung out together and he had made, he made this for me. Because he, he loved woodworking, so oh, so he it's wow. a it's like a cheese tray. Um, so I got to spend the day with Marie Sandre. That That's was cool. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, that's very cool. Um, and uh, Amy, I mean, I'm sorry. No, Amy, I can come to you next. It's going to come to Susan, but I'm going to make her nervous and wait. To the end. <laughs> um. <laughs> Is Natalie here tonight? Yep, Natalie's there. They're all Is here. she off the screen too? Because I, hi Natalie, wherever you are. Maybe if you hit the little blue button. This is I'm a lot like Natalie. Hollywood Squares, Marie. <laughs> well, remember who you're talking to here. You know what I don't, what I don't understand about technology will fill the Tampa Bucks Stadium. Go Bucks! <laughs> go Bucks! Go Bucks! <laughs> no, I still haven't found Natalie. Natalie's uh, off somewhere. <laughs> Change your view at the top right hand corner. It says, Oh, there you are. Hi, Natalie. <laughs> and Hi, Rachel Susan. is there. Yeah, I saw Rachel. I saw Rachel. I saw Susan. I saw you and finally saw Velvet. I just wanted to step in and say hi. I can't stay for very long, but Mark told me that when Mark told me that you guys were, were going to be interviewed, I thought, Oh, I got to step, step in and talk well, to my gals. You know what? Before I move on, this would be a good time uh, to talk about IWBC and the Monarch Brass, and especially like this kind of so-so trumpet section that you were telling me about, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so- Are you talking um, about the tour? Yeah, the tour. So, and, um, well, Velvet and I met, and actually, I, Marie, we met too in the, at 93 at the conference there. At the and conference, then, right. And then um, Velvet and Marie and I were in the first Monarch Brass tour, and the trumpet section, was Marie, Susan Slaughter, Carol Don Reinhardt, and myself. Oh, I was petrified. And then Velvet was also on that tour as well. Yeah. And um, so that's how we met Marie. And, and uh, yeah, that was an awesome, that was an uh, awesome 
group. It's great. And does does Mark know that Marin Alsop was our con conductor? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So <laughs> she was slumming with the brass players. Yeah. <laughs> it know, was I, really, really something. I've only gotten to play for Marin once, but it was uh, a Bartok concerto for the or for orchestra, and uh, I'm not going to say who it was in the orchestra or which orchestra it was. It was in Charlotte, and. <laughs> Somebody asked her, and he, he said, uh, Maestra, I have a question. And she said, oh, this person's name, just call me Marin. He said, yeah, are you in two or three there? She said, I'm in two, and it's Maestra. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, and also, by the way, there are some people watching that want to say hello. Uh, uh, Marie Closet from Canada, of course, says hello. Tony mm -hmm. Prisk says hi to Amy and Velvet. Uh, Lisa Marie Scott says something nice to me. Gail Williams is watching. Oh, hi, Gail. Hi, everyone. Andrew yeah, Tony and I were in school together. He was an undergrad when I was in graduate school at University of Illinois. Right. Tony and I talked a couple cool. hours ago. Um, Gail Williams says hi. Andrew Hitz wanted to thank Bill for her beautiful words about, about Sam. Uh, Mark Gould says, Velvet Brown, I can't believe I've never met her. And uh, Andrea Newman, uh, friend, our trombone friend from New York, says hi. And Monica Benson. And then uh, Marie Gale says hi. So that's the roll call of people talking to you guys. Um, but I'm going to keep moving because uh, then I can, I can get into this. Um, and I have all these notes um, which start right over here. So Rachel, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your background because Rachel right now is the professor of horn at Illinois State University. And, but before coming to Illinois, you were very active uh, in the studios in Los Angeles. Can you talk a little bit about your background before you came to ISU? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I've had a little bit of a, a windy road before I got to ISU. I, um, I did my master's and my doctorate at Cincinnati um, and uh, from after that point, kind of how I ended up in LA, um, I was, I spent a couple years uh, doing a lot of work with El Sistema youth orchestras. Um, and so I was doing a lot of that in uh, the Cincinnati area and in Lexington, Kentucky as well. Um, and I was um, just kind of at a point where I wanted to be doing my work with El Sistema, but I also wanted to um, be performing um, and doing all that. And, and in, in the kind of Cincinnati tri-state area, I was performing a lot, which was great, but I didn't have the opportunity to do the type of El Sistema work that I wanted to do because um, the brass uh, program in, in those programs was not as developed yet. Um, in case anyone doesn't know, El Sistema is the, the youth orchestra program from Venezuela. Um, that Gustavo Dudamel is a, a product of that. And it's all about uh, social change and youth development through equitable, equitable uh, music education programs. Um, so the El Sistema programs in the Cincinnati and Kentucky area, um, I worked with them, but they did not have uh, brass factions, if you will. Um, so I, I knew I kind of wanted to relocate to an area where I could play my instrument as much as I wanted to and do the type of El Sistema work that I wanted to. Um, so I just packed up and moved to LA, <laughs> which was... Anybody would do. Say that again? Of course, we would all do that. Oh, right, yeah. just a totally normal, totally normal uh, choice that people make. Um, I actually got really great advice. I was, um, this was when I was uh, finished with school and I was uh, studying with Tom Sherwood, um, who is a longtime associate principal horn of the Cincinnati Symphony. And he knew I was kind of trying to figure out where, where I should be and where I wanted to go. And uh, he was like, you know, Rachel, there's not going to be many more opportunities in your life where you make a big decision and the only person affected is you. Um, because you're young, you're single, you don't have any kids, you know, so if you're going to make a big life move, there's never going to be a better time than right now to do that. I was like, you know, that makes a lot of sense because even if I fall flat on my face, there's not anyone else uh, who's going to be harmed by that. Um, so I just picked up and moved to LA um, on a whim 
and um, worked out okay. <laughs> um, I lived there for, for four years uh, before I got my job at ISU. Um, and four years in LA is not a long time. Uh, like any major, I'm sure New York is very similar. Um, it takes quite a while to, to get your foot in the door there. So I was very fortunate to get to do um, the, the cool things that I, I did there. I, I subbed quite a bit with the Santa Barbara Symphony, which is a great orchestra. And um, I did get to do a little bit of uh, recording work um, for um, television shows and um, some work on albums and things like that, um, which was very, I, some people really, really enjoy it. Um, my, my partner is a studio musician, a, a tubist, um, and it's his favorite thing in the world to do is get into the studios. I found it very stressful. <laughs> um, it was just not, um, ultimately not for me, but a very, very cool experience to just get in there. Cause those, the LA studio musicians are, are some of the greatest musicians in the world. Um, and they're not all necessarily, they don't have some of the same uh, name recognition just because it's a more anonymous uh, kind of situation. You know, their names often don't show up in the credits on the, the movies they perform and things like that. But just because you don't know their names doesn't mean they're not incredible, incredible players. Uh, so I, I was really lucky to, um, to get to work with them while I was out there. That's, that's awesome. And uh, how did some of that experience in the studios, because obviously you have to be an assassin you know, when you're doing things and, and, and accurate. How did, how did some of your practice habits work out towards that? Did you start training for that kind of idea? I mean, I, I imagine as a trumpet player, we'd probably pull a Shoebrook book out. And Yeah, you know, um, actually, Randy Gardner um, at Cincinnati has uh, this exercise that he would do with us that helped me prepare for that. He would have, um, and this is this is the torture he put himself through when when he was younger, and he would um, tell us about it, and sometimes uh, make us do it as well. He would pull out the the very first book of the Maxime Alphonse, uh, which is a series of six uh, progressive etudes that most horn players know about. So the first book is, of course, the easiest one, and uh, he would make himself play each etude. Uh, perfectly three times in a row um, without chipping any notes, without missing any little articulations or accents or anything. And you had to do it perfectly three times in a row. If you missed the second to last note on the third time, you had to start all the way over from one. <laughs> um, and just the, the amount of focus you need to be able to do that. Um, if, if your mind is straying in any way, or if you check out for a moment, uh, it's just not going to work out for you. And, and that's how it is in, in the recording studio. You know, once that red light goes on, it's you just, you have to be laser focused with what you're doing, because if you're screwing up, everyone else is, uh, not too thrilled about that because you're making everyone else have to work harder and longer. Um, so you got to really come in and, and be ready to go. Yeah. And how did, and, uh, and how did some of those, how do you bring the experience of some of those uh, things that you did freelancing and, and playing some of the studios as well as the, the work you did around Cincinnati? How do you uh, talk to your students about the real world and, and kind of level with them sometimes about, what to expect. Yeah, and you know, uh, Velvet brought up some great points about this earlier, but I think it's so important, um, especially with performance majors, but, but really all music majors, that you're just really clear with them that the, the odds of you getting an orchestra job or a military band job, you know, no matter who you are, the <laughs> unless you're Marie's puppy and then you get any job you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going. To, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I need to. Uh, I need to say good night for now. But it's great to see everybody. Okay, stay. Yeah, it's great to see you too, Marie. Thank stay you, safe. Marie. Stay well. Stay healthy. Love you all. We love you. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.
And we're there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I, um, I think it's really important to, to level with students and because the odds of, of winning an orchestra job or, or a military band job are low. Um, you, you, can, you can do the work to get them and, and hopefully you'll be one of the lucky ones who does, but there'll be plenty of people who will never get one of those jobs. And that absolutely does not mean that they can't have a thriving career as a musician. And um, as Velvet said, you just have to play great. And if you play great and you're willing to just have an open mind and be entrepreneurial, then you can have a, a great career in the music field. Um, and I think I, I talk to a lot of my students about some of the other skills you need to be able to do that, such as excellent organizational skills. Um, and that's something I work with my students on a lot because a lot of students come into college not really having those skills very refined and maybe not understanding how important that is. Um, especially as a busy freelancer, you have to be organized or you're gonna double book yourself or you're not gonna account for the traffic getting from one gig to the next. You know, there's just so so many things you've got to think about and uh, just you've really got to have all your ducks in a row to be successful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the students are lucky to have that advice and uh, you know, it's, we've all been told it's not as easy as you think and then you don't believe it quite when you graduate and you realize yeah. it's not so easy. Yeah. Um, so, and then I want to talk to Susan a little bit before I talk to everybody in the group. Uh, Susan, I've probably known you the longest on here. Since uh, 1994. Yes, that sounds about right. Yes, 1994. Uh, when I came to school at IU, Susan was a master's student there. And then you did your doctorate at IU also. Yep. And uh, did your undergraduate in Northern Iowa. And you studied with Keith Johnson and Randy Grabowski and Charlie Gorham and, of course, Ed McCord. And uh, my first question is, is... Can you talk about those gentlemen and kind of how they mentored you and influenced your career as you, as you grew up? Absolutely. Um, I count myself very lucky with all the teachers I had. And those, those four gentlemen, along with Ray Kramer, who is Emeritus Director of Bands at IU, I will call the, the five people outside of my family who really influenced the trajectory of my life. Um, I started studying with Keith when I was in high school, actually, he was at Northern Iowa at the time. And, um, he really introduced me to the Jacobs, uh, school, the Arnold Jacobs concepts. And so I got introduced to those really early on in my trumpet playing life. Um, and I didn't really fully digest it and understand it at the time. I think it was just, I was just so young. Um, but I, I appreciated the fact that he planted those seeds in me because those, all of that just came back to me, you know, in all of the, all of my study with the other, with my other teachers. Um, so I did go to Northern Iowa. He was, um, and then after my freshman year, he, he got the job at uh, University of North Texas. And so I, I really had to make a decision about, you know, going to North Texas, which I certainly, um, Keith was interested in me uh, following him, um, but I was also on the search committee for the new trumpet teacher at Northern Iowa, and I was one of the student guinea pigs, so I got to, you know, go through that process and be, um, you know, taught by each of the candidates, and so Randy Grabowski, who ended up uh, getting the job and is still there to this day, um, he I had a really good rapport with him. I've really felt good about, um, you know, the, the time I had and his, his time of teaching me during his, uh, his day of, of interviewing. And so um, I really had to make a decision about, do I wanna go to uh, North Texas, which I know is, is obviously a fantastic music school, but very large uh, versus Northern Iowa, which is a smaller, fantastic, but a smaller school. And, I, I really felt like at the time that a school like Northern Iowa was, was good for me. Um, I liked the opportunities. I liked the size. Um, I just liked the feel of it. 
And I grew up in Cedar Falls where the school is. My dad taught in the chemistry department. And, and so I, I really grew, grew up around you and I. And um, as a kid would go to concerts and because, you know, Cedar Falls is situated in Northeast Iowa. Um, the, you have to kind of go far to, you know, see a lot of like bigger acts like Des Moines is two hours a drive away and Minneapolis is four hours north and things like that. So the, the influence of the school of music was really big with me during my childhood. So um, I, so I decided to stay in Northern Iowa and I knew I would have a, a great, great instruction from Randy and um but to go back to Keith, one of the things that Keith, Keith like introduced me to Armando Catala, one of, you know, one of the great trumpet greats. And I remember him saying, you got to get his recording of the Hummel Trumpet Concerto. And at that time, you know, we, it was on vinyl and like out of print or something. And so, like he said, you can order it at this one company. And I waited like six months for this recording. I have it to this day. It's in my other room. And, uh, and it was totally worth it. He said, it's like, this, this is the definitive recording. And so, you know, early on, Keith really introduced me to you know, people like Armando Gatala and, um, and what, you know, what a, a joy to discover uh, his artistry so early in life. Um, but with Randy, um, I actually got to play second trumpet in the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony in my last two years at Northern Iowa and Randy was principal. And so I got to sit next to fantastic trumpet playing of Randy Grabowski, hear him play tr principal, but also try to learn how to be a good second trumpet to him. And so not only was I getting great instruction in, the, uh, in his teaching studio, but also just sitting next to him. And so I, I, I felt like that was, uh, that experience was just as important as anything. But one of the things that really impresses me about Randy one of the many things is as his soft playing, and that really made an impression on me. You know, the trumpet, as obviously we know it, is a bright, brilliant, and very loud instrument. But he, in his hands, it was just so subtle. His the subtlety of his playing really made an impression on me, and and I thought I really want to, you know, make sure I've got hopefully got that in my playing as well you know, the, the beauty of the trumpet away from the brilliance of, of and the power of it. Um, so, you know, Randy had gone to Indiana and, and he hadn't necessarily like pushed me toward Indiana, but he said, you know, you should consider it. So I went and got some lessons with Charlie Gorham, who he had studied with. Uh, he had studied with Louis Davidson at, at IU as well, but also with Charlie. And, and so I really made a good connection with Charlie. And um, so when I was picking schools for grad school, um, I did settle on Indiana. Although I, I did um, audition at Eastman, uh, Barbara Butler and Charlie Geyer were there at the time. And to go back and, and Barbara grew up in the same hometown that I grew up in. And so growing up, I heard her name all the time, you know, people would see a trumpet in my hand and go, oh, Barbara Butler. And I'm like, I need to, this Barbara Butler, this is Barbara Butler, you know? And, you know, I kind of realized then who she was and everything. And so she was really one of my first inspirations, although I, it, it took me a few years to finally meet her and everything, but I always really appreciated knowing about her and then finally hearing her play and um, just going, oh my gosh, there's this woman who just plays so gloriously and just this command of the trumpet and the command of the musicianship and, and with her husband, what a great partnership, you know, they have, of course. And so I really appreciated knowing about her. Um, you know, I, I never thought it was odd to be a female trumpet player. Uh, you know, no one ever really, you know, said, oh, you know, what's this all about? So, but it was cool to have some, to see someone so successful like her early on in my life. Um, so now fast forward, I decided I did audition Eastman and actually, um, there's, you know, there's, they were just, there's such popular teachers as anyone's listening here knows. Uh, so it was really hard to get into their studio. So, um, so I ended up not getting into her studio, but, um, but IU felt right. 
and I knew Mr. Gorham and, um, and so Charlie was such a brilliant man. Um, he is a real, he was kind of a real grandfather to all of us. You know, I, I, I came into his studio toward the end of his teaching career and, um, and I was one of his teaching assistants for three years, uh, Todd Davidson, who was his other teaching assistant. He actually had two teaching assistants because he was the head of the brass department and he decided that any trumpet major or trumpet minor at the school was gonna have contact with a major trumpet teacher. And so he would always take an overload um, and so they allowed him to have two teaching assistants. And so um, Todd and I would meet with some of those students half time, and then Charlie would meet with some of them. And I always really appreciated that. You know, he really felt very strongly about that. But <laughs> you go into a lesson with him and, and all of a sudden he'd be starting to talk about planting trees or going sailing or uh, all the wars of the world have always been started by religion, you know, and we would launch into these like non-musical topics for about 45 minutes of your lesson. And then he would be like, let's get the Mel, Mel Broyles duets out, transposing duets and play some duets. And, um, but I, I appreciated those conversations though. They felt kind of intimidating because he was so brilliant. Um, but I think what he was trying to do was like, yes, you're focused and yes, you, you know, this is, you're learning how to be a musician and trumpet player, but make sure you know about the world and make sure you expand your horizons and make sure that you're not so focused. And so I think he would have those conversations with not just me, but the other students. And um, I, I think they were topics he really loved and, and he was very passionate about too. So um, and one other thing about Charlie that I think a lot of people don't know is that he was an accomplished pianist. And so when um, our pianist would come in with us, if we're working on a recital or solo, um, and maybe they weren't completely practiced on their part, he would like kind of like tell them, well, you missed those notes. And I think it would freak a lot of them out because they're like, you know, they were thinking, ah, he's not listening to me. Well, he was listening. <laughs> and so, um, and I remember him saying, you know, I went to Interlaken and uh, when I was a kid and I learned how to play the piano from Percy Granger. You know, he was my first trumpet or my first piano um, teacher. And I'd be like, and he would like throw those things out. And it was so funny, you know? So he was, um, he was such a, a, uh, a gift to me and really nurturing and uh, really introduced me to uh, so much, you know, so, so many of the resource books that are important in the field and things like that. So he retired when I was there and then I went and then studied with Ed Cord for two years. And that was just really the right time for me to go and study with Ed and, um, Ed is uh, very, I, I would call him very cerebral and, and very, we talked a lot about the head game of being a musician and he really helped me with my audition preparation and, and, you know, getting into that, the mental game of, of being a musician. And he's such a curious person too. And so we would just have these really you know, great conversations about so many things. And I think you know, also having him be someone who is curious made me want to be, make sure I'm curious about things and finding out about things. And so those two years I, I, I worked with Ed um, before I left Bloomington uh, were, were really important Time, it was an important time for me as far as my playing. And I really feel like my playing, you know, went to a different level with him. Um, and I, I so appreciate it. And what's so interesting to me is both Ed and Randy are both former Charlie Gorham students. And I'm, of course, a Char Charlie Gorham student. And yet all three of them were very different kinds of teachers. Right. And it's, it's kind of kind of neat. Uh, even though they studied with him and I did, they're, they're obviously their personalities uh, really showed through in, in their teachings. So, when you had a crossover, yeah, fantastic. With Andy and Ed also, right? With, with uh, 
Arnold Jacobs. You had an Arnold Jacobs crossover with with Keith and and with Ed Cord as well. Exactly. Yeah. So that's where just all of those concepts. You know, I was uh, yeah. Obviously, I was older when I got to Ed, and so I could process that stuff. And I'd be like, I remember Keith telling me that. You know, at that time and. Yeah. Um, now that makes sense and, and those kinds of things. And I was ready and I was open to uh, accepting those things into my psyche and into my playing. Yeah. Now, how long have you been in the band now? Uh, since 1997. So I'm, I'm getting my, I'm in my 24th year with the Marine Band. Yes. Wow. Yes. So, so are there any highlights that, you you think about with the band i mean over the years you've seen a lot of things okay, is there anything that kind of sticks out oh wow you know it's funny like when you're in a place long enough you like everything kind of mushes together uh, but i mean there's certainly things uh that do stand out like um so re the band always plays the presidential inauguration and i just did my sixth inauguration <laughs> Uh, so the first one I did, I did 20 years ago. Uh, and so I would say that an event like that really stands out, um, just because of the significance of it for our nation right. and to just be a part of something that, uh, has kind of the world attention, um, that, and the, the band plays, a you know, a role in the, in the musical support of what goes on with that. So, you know, it's always special to be a part of something like that. And, um, I mean, there's so, there's so many great experiences that I've had with the band. Um, we've got, you know, you get to work with a lot of great guest artists and, and really one person who stands out there is that uh, a comp film composer, John Williams, is someone that the band, we've worked with him a few times and he's become such a great friend to the band and um, to play his music with him is extraordinary and then he's just like a super nice guy yeah. on top of it you know so here's this extraordinary uh talent who is just you know he's just kind of a regular guy if you meet him and it's it just endears you to him even more but uh it, uh, that those were really special have been special times to work with someone like that um but i would say just you know working with my colleagues, you know, Nat talks about, um, you know, her Navy band colleagues. And I really feel like that with my Marine band colleagues. Uh, we, you know, you, you, you play in so many different kinds of situations. Um, and, and, you know, we have to play in cold weather and hot weather and, and then, you know, you get the chance to play in, you know, weather <laughs> in temperatures that are normal and make sense to play, playing your instrument. And, and everyone just always sounds really great, no matter what. <laughs> yeah. And it's just really, and everyone's so supportive. And, um, you know, we have 18 trumpet players in, in the band and, and we just really are a unit as a section and not only just musically, but also just personally, you know, everyone just looks out for each other and really cares for each other. And so it's just really, it's really neat to be a part of uh, a musical organization where people really take care of each other. And does that, um, does that supportive atmosphere happen even when you're having challenges? Yeah, it does. And like people, I think because we go, we're in so many different kinds of circumstances that everyone just sort of goes with the flow. What you know, it's just sort of like, well, uh, this is our circumstance. So I guess we have to ju just go with it, you know, and, and, and people just do it. It's yeah, it's great. It's really cool. But do you ever try to jump ahead of anybody's chair with the challenges? <laughs> you got the band challenge, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I've been waiting on that for a week. Yeah, I bet you have. <laughs> you know, it's neat though. You know, one of the things I've really loved about being in the band is like, is getting the chance to play all the different parts. So, you know, you can play principal, but then you might find yourself on the, the third cornet folder. Yeah. 
And actually really, it's really fun to play the low parts. I find I, I did that with inauguration. Actually, I was on one of the low. And so I was playing a lot with the horns. I felt like I needed to bring my horn with me. Um, and, and so I, uh, it's just really, you know, the way our, the section is set up as we do so much rotation that you, you don't get stuck on one part. And so I really appreciate that. And just, you know, and it really makes you have to be ready for anything. And yeah, we obviously do have our principal player players designated and they will play those parts all the time, but the rest of us get to rotate. Um, so it's, re it's, it's really, it's really a nice situation. Isn't um, it whoever shows up last for rehearsal gets to play first part? That's how it works with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we're, I guess we're structured a little bit differently. You, you won't, you're not going to have to like um, think about that situation. You kind of know what you're going to be doing when you get to work. <laughs> That's hilarious. And uh, our, Susan, our, our, uh, our friend from Indiana, Chris Nygaard, did like the band challenges question. So I, <laughs> I figured he would. Hey, Chris. <laughs> so I know I've asked you guys, and you guys have been so patient. I've asked a million questions of you guys individually, but I wanted to spend just a few minutes because I, Susan, I could go on asking you Marine Band questions all night um, or questions about Indiana or things outside yes. of protocol. But I'll avoid it. Um, so we'll stay friends. And, <laughs> but I, I'd like to talk to Amy and Velvet about how the group began back in 2010. So um, I'll start in Velvet, you can kick in any time here. Um, Velvet and I met in 93 and we actually uh, played in an, another group uh, in, called Velvet Brass. And after we met in 93, uh, I got a phone call from Susan Slaughter. She was actually the other trumpet player in the group. And she said, hey, um, do you want to drive up to Evans, Evans, Evanston and play some sight reads and brass quintets for the day with a group of people? And, and I thought, sure, I'll drive three hours. It's three hours drive for me. I'll, I'll drive three hours and go do this. And so went up and, and played in, you know, reading through quintets for the day and then Susan said, well, let's all go out for dinner and, and uh, chat for just, you know, just hang out together. I was like, sure, that's fine. I don't have anything else to do the rest of the day. We get to dinner and Susan said, well, um, that was actually an audition. We'd, we'd like to offer you the other trumpet position in our quintet. <laughs> so, um, so I said, great. And then as it, I just listening to, to you and, and uh, Susan talked in, wasn't it 94 Velvet that we played for your recital at the brass when the, the brass symposium happened at, at Indiana? Was it at 94? Um, 95, that big. At 95, yeah. So you were there, right? Yeah. So yeah. Mark, you and Susan would have been there when, when uh, Velvet had did that recital and uh, she had Velvet Brass uh, play on that. So we were in that group for a while and then everybody went on, you know, went their separate ways and, then Susan called us back. Well, we played together in Monarch Brass Quintet on a tour to Germany um, together. And then Susan called us back to play in St. Louis and then called us back to, again to play Velvet and I back to play in another quintet for a Delta Omicron conference. And Velvet and I were going, gosh, we missed this. We need to put a group together. So um, that's how Stiletto formed then was we kept, Velvet and I kept coming back after Velvet Brass and realized we just love quintet and we loved working together and we had to make this something that we did more, more often and not just every once in a while, so. Yeah, it was um, just wonderful thinking about it and um, it, it, it's, the idea exploded and it, it, it was as though right then and there, the quintet was, was uh, stiletto brass was, was born and it just took off. Yeah. And stiletto means um, shoes and Velvet and I have a love of, of Italy. So when we were trying to come up with a name because she, she did, she studied in Italy for a while and I have that trumpet festival that I do in Orvieto. Um, and so we said, we have to somehow tie 
uh, you know, Italy into, into the name of the group. And so we, that's how we came up with the name Stiletto. Velvet, I don't know if Amy told you this, but she said if I ever played the BAME sex set with you, you would call it Crocs for just a piece. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> I was even thinking that, uh, you know, in the next 15 years or something, the name may have to change to uh, <laughs> um, Easy Spirit. <laughs> 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 were, Velvet, were you, were you, and, and, and Susan, were you at the, the birthday party thing at, at Harvey Phillips Ranch during that brass festival? You remember that? I was waiting because it was in the brass choir, but it was like like yeah. Arnold Jacobs' eighty second birthday party, and Timothy Dockchitzer was there, and all the Summit guys, and I thought Arvin and Clark were going to roll out of a cornfield. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or something. It was very. That, I don't remember if I made it to the birthday party, but what I remember about that festival was like it. It was almost overwhelming. Um, you know, it was just this this conjunction of all of the brass conferences together and to see I Doc Scheitzer perform live was extraordinary you know just I mean it was almost too much and it was it was awesome but it was like oh my it was too good almost too much of a good thing um to just really soak it all in I just I thought it was extraordinary that it even happened and um, yeah, I mean, it's it's all a blur. It was so great. <laughs> this is so much good stuff. Yeah. Well, that thing at the that there was a there was a birthday party. I'll say briefly. We'll get back to your interview, which I'm giving you. But the, <laughs> there was this. There so there was this party at Harvey Phillips' house, and Harvey had this. I've told the story before. He had this ranch red ranch house with a silo in the back and a cornfield behind it. And we show up, and it's like we're the only students because we're in the brass choir. And there's all the summit guys and it was, you know, it was Ray and Gail and Tony and all these, you know, you look staring at your heroes. And then I, I look and Leonard Condelaria is talking to Doc Schitzer and there's Jacobs. We're saying 82nd birthday party to Arnold Jacobs. And I drove back to the campus with John Romley. He's like, that was kind of strange, right? And I was like, <laughs> what? more than I, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of people. Yeah, it's like wow. it's like the Hall of Fame of of brass players, all in you know, put together in this one you know in like Southern Indiana. Yeah, you know, it was crazy. It was oh, yeah, it was amazing. That's, that's the only night of college I ever wish there were cell phones. Yeah, <laughs> the rest of it, no. Yes. No, no chance. Um, could you guys talk a little about your programming? Because you do a nice mix of, of serious pieces, new pieces that you have written for you, and then the, and the more popular pieces. How do you come up with your programming? Who kind of decides that? I think we all do. I mean, I think everybody talks about pieces that they've heard or, or that they would like to play. And, and uh, you know, we, we get together and do a sight reading, you know, some sight reading sessions and just, it's, it's not even to get ready for tour. It's just to read through pieces and start to put things together. And um, usually we come up with one big piece and then try to work around it, you know, um, in our yeah. programming. And one thing that's very important, and I know it's something that I uh, usually will say or uh, at the concerts, but let's say there are two people that... Um, or attending the concert and um, one person really wants to go in general the other person is kind of uh, obliged to go right and so um, we realize that and um, we don't play our concerts in chronological order we don't wait until the second half to play um, pop themes or so forth it's um, it, Basically, um, <laughs> the, way, the, the way that I think about it is that someone could, c can enjoy the first piece and then that it may be classical. And then there's something else that, that, the, that the, the partner that's there will enjoy. And then we're back to, so that way somebody's um, always enjoying something um, and, and not needing to go past more than one pieces. But 
uh, one, more than one piece. But it actually turns out that with the storytelling about the pieces and the um, um, variety of music that we play, that it ends up that the person that, that would have said or would say uh, something like, I thought I would only have enjoyed the Duke Ellington pieces that you played on the concert will talk about the amazing um, piece, uh, Copper Wave, that Joan Tower um, um, wrote and, and say that I the, the way that it was described, and Amy does a fantastic job of describing that piece, and um, it just really brings you in and people love it. So um, we do the storytelling um, and we, we want the audience members to uh, be informed, um, mm -hmm. understand what we're doing and um, also not to wait until the very last piece before they can tap their toe. I think everybody likes to, to, to talk to, we make it more personable. So it, we want the audience to be a part of the concert with us and not just we're on stage and, and they're out, out there somewhere. So there, that connection, I think, is something that we really strive to do and are very successful at it. And we have, I think, uh, we have a lot of people come up afterwards and say that very same thing about how, you know, they felt they were actually a part of the concert. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a very, I think that's an unusual approach, but a very smart one to programming, because then you're, you're like you said, you're opening up their ears to the other pieces. And, and Amy, to go with what you're saying, I mean, you are really giving them access. I mean, that's a lot of times what that, that's what people are paying for, right, is access to us versus just wanting to watch us through a, almost like Correct. A yeah, and you know, we try to do some new pieces too. And, and even, like Savella said, you know, that they may not, um, people, there may be people there that, that don't really like new music, but we think it's important that they, they you know, get the whole, the whole, realm of music and so we'll do like a copper wave or the Lubislavsky mini overture but when you talk about it and you know and you you give them some description of it it opens them up there I think it opens them up to to really listening to the piece and and they may still not particularly like it you know when we're finished but I think we've done something and we've said something to them that it, they think about oh yeah or they'll yeah, that's right. Natalie described that, you know, when when she when she was talking about the piece before we played it, or or something like that. So um, it's it's important, I think, to give them a taste of everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you talk about uh, in some of the kind of concerts you play? You also play a lot of children's concerts when you guys tour. Is that right? You're kind we of we do, yeah. Talk about how you program for children's concerts, because that's always kind of a balance I find when I'm involved in those things. Anybody else want to jump in there? I remember a couple of memorable times when we were playing for really little kids. And this was, I think, right outside Chicago on a Midwest tour we did. It was really cold and snowy. But we played for a preschool class, which was the youngest group of kids that I've ever played for with a brass quintet. And they loved the Lion Sleeps Tonight. We played that for them and had them all singing. And yeah, it was just really fun. I mean, it was really fun to engage them that way. I'm trying to remember what other pieces we chose to play for those little kids. Um, I remember a concert that we did in, in Kentucky and we did the Dvorak. Um, and it was the same thing that we had a gymnasium full. I think there must've been 750, uh, what was it? Five kindergarten through fourth grade in this gym. And the same thing, you know, we, we did this divorce piece and afterwards this little four-year-old, five-year-old came up to me and she tugged on my pants leg and she's looking up to me and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, thank you so much for playing that beautiful piece. It was so beautiful. And she cried and I cried and, you know, <laughs> but it was, it was one of those moments where we decided to do, you know, that, that theme from Dvorak and, and um, even the five-year-olds, they got it, you know? Um, so we don't, we don't try to make it uh, just, pop tunes or things we we try to again that mixture of of music and and uh to get them in, but we have them involved uh you know we do listening games with them and things like that so uh, it's i think it's important i think we all 
have come from public school and uh, band programs, and we think it's important to give back. And so we that's one of our big missions is to go and, you know, um, do those concerts and, and help develop the love of music um, with those students, whether they go into band or not, that that's not our goal. Our goal is to have them love music and to have them have had such a great experience from from our concert that, you know, they remember that. Um, so. What are, what are some of the difficulties with a quintet like this where you're all spread out all over the place? How do you deal with scheduling and booking things and figuring out we're going to have this much rehearsing? And what, how, do, how do you deal with some of the challenges, you might say, of having a, a brass quintet that's so spread out? So uh, one of the, um, the first, the first thing is that we decide how much we're going to be on, um, on the road for the year. And everyone has, um, <laughs> everyone major, major positions that take, um, um, take a lot of time. Um, but we decide and we were, we'll go away. We we're trying to, figure we were trying to figure out the magic time like 10 days is a day and a half too much you know and <laughs> four days is not quite long enough you know to really trying to figure out the the perfect the perfect the perfect time and so basically we we've come up with it it's about six days or so that we like to go out um about six days um and we clear our we clear our calendar we uh, talk about the 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 zone that we're gonna um, the zone in the U.S. that we're gonna go to, um, and um, we just start to we start to get to work um, after we've set in our in our books um, the different dates, and we try to do that early before you know something else gets 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 in there uh, outside of our you know big major big major jobs. So we try to we try to do that early. Um, and then we get together, um, always putting, um, um, well, first of all, we know the music that we're going to play and we would have decided the music based on having a, a, a music retreat weekend where we read music and, and laugh and shop and cook dinners and so forth and so on. So, um, just, just reading, um, a bunch of music and, and deciding our, um, our, our program, everybody, is also um, charged with bringing um, music to our attention um, and to say, yeah, this would be great here. Da, 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 da. Um, and then we then we meet a day and a half uh, prior to our um, our first um, our first performance, and we have um, a combination of uh, concert series performances, but um, we always have the public school component. Uh, because as Amy said, we are all products of the um, of public schools, but that is one of our missions to go and um, give back, to go and um, and to educate. And we're, when we're playing some of the school concerts, um, you, you know, you have the the teachers that are really happy um, to to um, have the students you know, in a in an assembly, um, but when the teachers are are really listening and enjoying as well. Um, we know that we've we've um, we've um, fulfilled fulfilled our mission of um, of educating and um, everyone that's there. Uh, also, just given memories. I there was a story there, this uh, in Kentucky. One of the band directors, um, um, or maybe he was a principal or something. That's a friend of um, Amy's said that one of the students went home that day after a, after a um, one of our school concerts and uh, told his uh, mom that he wants to marry Velvet Brown, the tuba player. <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it's really about making sure that we see the students that we are playing, playing for. Even if they're 750, um, we, we know the importance. We don't look above them. We look at them. We look, we bring them to us because, you know, just that, that familiar, that look just says, 
thank you for being here. Uh, it also says, um, I see you. That is extremely important. Um, and, um, and there we have uh, this, this trust that develops from, um, from, the, from the students uh, to, to listen, to be engaged. 750 students, quiet. You know, they're moving around. I mean, I know what that's all about. I have a young son, he doesn't stand still. But it's, um, it's wonderful. I mean, but um, we, so we want to make sure we have that, that component of um, public schools. And then we have our concert series, or if we're playing, uh, you know, featured with a, an orchestra or, or, or so. Um, and, you know, as we, as we keep going, we will be able to um, have um, a little bit more time. Amy was, I mean, she's uh, newly, newly retired. Um, and still plays in many, many orchestras and things, but um, oftentimes you know, we had to get to her book first in, the, in a lot of ways because, um, uh, but now maybe we can eke out um, three or four tours, um, uh, uh, big ones a year. Yeah. So I important. think everybody, I think everybody here can, can say, I mean, when we do those, those children's concerts, how much fun they are. I mean, we just have a blast doing those. It's just so much fun, you know. Well, I think what Velvet said is so important. I mean, we've all, I know we've all played in quintets where a school concert is just a gig and you blow in and blow out and the attitude's not great about it. And everybody's, we've all experienced it that, but it's, that's a wasted opportunity, yep. right? And, and, and especially now with the way things are, you, you really have to do it right because things are going to be hurting after this pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's, and, and kind of going back to you, what you were saying about that, Velvet, what, I mean, just so people that are watching and are in those situations and you're talking about connecting with kids, what do you think are the important components that make that happen? Like, when, what, is it the music you play? Is it the way you speak to them? Is it what you say to them? And what, what kind of things do you think resonate with them? Yes. <laughs> All of that. Uh, certainly the, 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 the music that we play and, the same way that for the, the the concert series that we have where we explain something about the music or we can talk about um, um, listening to the different the different layers of music um, so they the students are engaged that way um, every all every, every kid wants to to have the right answer right so yep. um, so we have we have kind of um, musical games that way. We also engage student conductors. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I, I just, if, if I think about being on the stage, um, you know, it's not about just finding the next piece of music. Um, when someone's talking, I'm, I'm connecting. I purposely connect. Because, well, I was also a um, public school teacher for six years. And so, and teaching from fourth grade to high school, I know what it's like to be in the classroom as a teacher. And I know the importance of that connection. And I will never forget that or think of it in any different manner as, as just because I'm a tuba player in a, in a, in a brass quintet. And so... It's really making making that connection, and so also thinking about it in a, a way of um, it being um, a lesson plan, and there's a value to the pieces that we're playing that the students will that the students will um, will get. Um, introducing the in, the different instruments, each person in the in the group, they get to talk about their instrument and be excited, uh, you know, about that. Um, in, in such a great way, e explaining how the instrument works, what it sounds like, playing something familiar that everybody knows um, uh, to get them excited about, as I said, you know, the trumpets and the horn and the trombone and, um, and, then, the, and then the tuba. Great. So I, I also, if I remember right, we did some, some master classes or some guest residencies at some schools where we actually worked with other, like, I did. I had a master class with pianos, and I think Rachel, didn't you do strings? 
on on some of those or was that you susan yeah i worked with a double bass player yeah I, yeah awesome it was awesome i mean i did yeah. i did a master class with two high school pianists and we talked about music and i you know so and Natalie, didn't you have flute? Who had, or was that you? Some we had all the different instruments, and I think we all got back together, not really knowing that that was going to happen. And we talked about how amazing those yeah. master classes were. Yeah, and they certainly. Yeah, and the well, and I was uh, sorry, Rich. I was going to say, and I remember it was the Kusevitsky second movement of his uh, the concerto, Kusevitsky concerto with this double bass player. And I kind of know the piece and I listened to it and this, and I, what I appreciated was that this, the student wasn't looking at me like, ah, she's just a trumpet player. What does she know? We really got to talk about just the music. Like, I don't understand all the technique, but I can understand the music. And, and it was such a engaging, productive uh, 20 minutes, however long it was. Yeah. It was really inspiring. I, it yeah. was cool. I really loved it. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. The, the kids knew that we were not experts of their instrument and, and they could not have cared less. They were just really thrilled to be working with professional musicians who knew more about music than, than they did at their young age. And they were just really sponges. And yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, those, those concerts are just so important. Um, uh, I was also going to ask about, you know, in all of your early years, I mean, I mean, Amy and I talked about this earlier, but it seems that there's a theme that all of you had some sort of strong woman in your life that kind of paved the way for you wanting to be able to do this or letting it happen. I mean, can you guys speak to that maybe individually about who those figures were? Well, I mean, I can go, I know I've mentioned Barbara yep. um, and and I, I became aware of Susan Slaughter, too, when I was younger. I remember, I don't mention my mother, um, who is a very strong uh, person, and she's an amazing influence in my life, too. And I think one of the things my mother was, I think my mother recognized you're a female trumpet player. That's, that, that is not a typical thing. And I think she did everything she could to try to make me aware of what women were doing in the field. So I remember her cutting out an article about auditions that are now done behind the screen. And that started happening, you know, 30, 35 years ago and um, making me aware like, hey, these, these changes are going on and, and these are, this is good for everyone in the music field that this kind of process is going on. And I think Susan Slaughter may have been mentioned in that article and so I became aware of Susan and, um, and then just slowly, you know, through my career, becoming aware of women have been doing this all along. <laughs> and, uh, and we know history is written by the loudest voices. And so women haven't always had that same kind of platform. And so I think one of the things that uh, as, as being involved with the IWBC is to really bring to light a lot of these women who have been out there and doing extraordinary things for a really long time. Um, and so um, I know everyone else wants to talk about their influences, but I would say early on for me, it was definitely Barbara and, and Susan. And then I, I met Amy, uh, we met at IU, you came and did something. And, and Amy became someone for me that I really respected and, and was a role model for me uh, through those years of my life. So it's just been really awesome to, uh, you know, now we get to play together and that's been great. And, uh, and Velvet is someone that I've known for, for a really long time too. And so to finally get to play with her is fabulous. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's just exponential, you know, the, the, the awareness and the growth there. So. Anybody else? Natalie, you want to talk? Yeah. I can go next. Yeah, I, I had a little bit of a different take on it. I think that I picked the trombone and liked it so much because there were no girls that played it, and I always liked doing something contrary. <laughs> and so that's, 
I think part of the reason I enjoyed it for a really long time was that surprise factor that I knew when I went into an audition, maybe the judges wouldn't give me the time of day at first until I started to play. And then that surprise factor where they would look up, because I was really small too. So um, I didn't have any female role models until um, well into college. And that was the first time I was aware of another woman playing the instrument, and that was Ava Ordman, who was also in the state of Michigan. And I got to see her do a solo recital when I was a senior in college, and that was that was really amazing to see her play at such a high level. It wasn't until I started playing professionally that I sought out a community of women brass players on purpose. And one of those was we had a, um, a military all-female brass ensemble and that was the first time I traveled with that group to go to my first IWBC. And that's when I heard Monarch play for the first time. And that really, really changed everything for me and made me really want to be a part of that community. So, so for me, like I said earlier, my mother um, played cornet when women definitely didn't play, you know, um, in a high school band. And, um, so she, she was the one that with the, the records and she always encouraged me to play, um, took me to my lessons, drove me to my lessons every week. And, and, um, you know, we played duets for a while until she said I passed her up so that she couldn't keep up with me. <laughs> so, um, but then I didn't hear, um, I was, uh, a freshman in college and I drove to Cincinnati and heard Mahler one. And I looked in the program and I see the name Marie Speziali and, and I'm going, Oh my goodness. I had no idea, you know? Um, and then again, it was uh, the international women's brass conference in 93 that I went and it was like a weight off my shoulder that there were so many other women who played brass instruments. And uh, it's like, wow, I'm not alone. Like I thought I was, you know? Um, and then it just developed from there. And like I said, now getting to play within this group, is just amazing. Um, it's just, we have so much fun. And, and you know, all these women here are, are my role models. And I'm in rehearsal with, I'm wanting to, to you know, to play as well as Susan or, you know, match velvet as, as, and I, and I learn all the time. I learn from them every time we get together, it's a learning, it's a learning process and, and um, inspiration to be with these, with these ladies. So they're my role models too. <laughs> you know how the, there's uh the, when someone does something well in a um, brass ensemble, I tell you, it, or in, in an orchestra and we, and we place our feet up the, this ensemble because we're um, inspiring each other all the time. I tell you, our, we would um, have our, if we could, our feet would be up all the time because there's something so cool that, that you want to connect with, you know. Um, That's and, hard to uh, do with stilettos too, I might add. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But, Don't uh, flinging them across the room. Yeah. <laughs> take your word for that. Yeah, it's it's just it's just I I, I will say it's it's great. I mean, just uh, and and how quickly um, the, the 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 other aspect too. I mean, when I mean everyone has come into the group at you know different times, but how quickly um, the giving and the take. Of, of lines and energy um, just occurs. And that's just, just I, well, just to use the word, it's dynamic. It, it, I can't say uh, uh, enough about that. Um, mm -hmm. I'll segue quickly into just my, my um, I, uh, role models. Um, I started out as a trumpet player in fourth grade. Um, I was the only female bunch of um, guys playing fourth grade, you know, in that time, girls and boys, you know, don't like to play together. Um, and um, I noticed across the band, there was um, someone that looked like me playing the sousaphone. So I thought that must be my instrument. That's what I'm supposed to 
play. I mean, I'm not playing, I'm playing trumpet, but I always kind of admired that person. And that uh, she was, she was good. She was a couple of years older, um, uh, but was only there for a little bit. I remember she moved and I and, uh, just remember her first name, but from when I got to junior high school, so I kept, kept playing the trumpet, but when I got to junior high school, the band director uh, needed a tuba player. And I thought, finally, I get to play the girl's instrument because that was the role model that I had, right? A, a little girl that looked like me played the tuba. Um, um, so that's just the, an early story. But um, early on, when I, when I started taking private lessons in high school, um, I knew about Connie Weldon because my teacher in high school was in the Naval Academy band, Scott Terrebor, and he always talked about Connie. I believe that on a few lessons, he got her on the phone, you know, where um, for her to listen to me or for me to hear something or something. But he was, um, uh, I just felt like I knew her before I even met her because he talked about it all the time. Then at some point later, I studied with Sam, whose teacher was also Connie. So I had Connie again um, as someone that, uh, that was just talking uh, that the, they were just, they adored her, absolutely adored her. Uh, all that they've done, uh, that, uh, um, that she did for them, as well as her accomplishments. So I had a role model that had done all kinds of things already. So that was really cool. Um, second and uh, third, junior high school band director was a trumpet player, graduate of the University of Michigan back in the I don't know, the fifties or something like that. Amazing trumpeter um, that it just, it just instilled excellence in her band from posture to musicianship tests that we had to take. Um, and um, basically saying you're, you're auditioning for all state. Here's the paper, take it home, sign it. I'm driving, bring it back tomorrow. And here's the music. I'll help you learn it. Okay, cool. And that's what happened all through the whole junior high school time. And so um, a huge role model for excellence, also playing Christmas things and her trumpet playing, oh, was just so beautiful um, and brilliant. Um, so that was a role model. And then obviously, obviously um, um, Susan and Marie and all the people, um, the, the, the respected elders of, of the I, IWBC, um, um, I, I knew nothing of that energy and excellence um, um, because it, by that time um, uh, Connie Weldon was no longer playing but she was a, a, an icon so um, and then growing up with um, very strong um, uh, uh, women uh, figures my grandmother mother of nine and my mother uh, powerhouse in her in her in her position um, in the government and so just go and you do and you do and make sure it's uh, your best effort always. And that was from everyone that uh, had an influence on me. Awesome. I'll just chime in real, real quickly um, with mine. I, um, my mom remembered a comment that I made about the French horn when I was little. I was at my older sister's band concert and I just said, mom, I want to play that one when I get into band. And I pointed to the horn. I just liked the way it looked. I had no idea how it sounded or anything. And then I forgot about that incident. And then when I got into middle school, she was like, well, we have to figure out how to rent you a French horn because that's what you're playing. And it's like, oh, okay. I guess that's what I'm doing. Um, and, and that turned out just fine as it turns out. Um, but I, I grew up in uh, Winchester, Virginia, which is uh, not a terribly large place. And um, there was literally no horn teacher there when I was growing up. So it was not an option to take from a man or a woman. There was just, a, that, that wasn't a thing uh, taking from a horn player. So I, I took lessons from, a trumpet teacher in town. And then I was in Fairfax County for some reason in high school. I don't even remember why, but I, I was there with my mom and we happened to walk past a brass quintet playing. Um, and I heard the horn player and was like, whoa, that lady is awesome. 
And um, I, it ended up being um, Sylvia Alamina from National Symphony. Um, and I just, I, I had no idea who she was at the time, but I just, I was like, I have to go talk to her. We, we stayed for the rest of the performance and I just went up and introduced myself and talked to her at the end. And I was just like, I, I wanna do what she's doing and, and figure that out. Um, and then I was very lucky. I did my undergrad at James Madison University. And at the time that I was there, Ad Pack was the horn professor there. So I had a, an awesome um, female professor for my undergrad. And then when I went to Cincinnati, in addition to uh, studying with Randy Gardner there, I also studied with Liz Freimuth and a little bit with Lisa Conway as well on the side, who are just amazing uh, female uh, uh, all-star horn players and role models and, and everything else. So I was really lucky to have their influence at, at a great time. You know, in listening to all of you discuss this, I, I, I started to think about um, in my own experience, because at least I'm a guy, and it's never struck me as odd to see a woman playing a brass instrument. It's never, it's never but that's just because I'm lucky because people came before you guys and, and some things that you guys did that it's not a big deal. I mean, when I got to Indiana, I mean, uh, Susan and, and Stacy Simpson and Ingrid Redstock were three of the best, if not the best trumpet players there. So I thought, well, okay, whatever. I never thought about it. But if I was 20 years older or 30 years older, that might've been a bigger deal. And I remember being uh, taking, uh, doing an interview for a college, and I won't say which one, but somebody, and this was not on the script of the questions they were asking, said, uh, how do you treat your, uh, do you treat your male students and female students any different? And I said, no. And, and I was kind of horrified by the question, realizing later that she could have asked that because she was older and that could have been stranger for her. <clears throat> but then I said, you did look and see that Marie Speziali was one of my teachers, right? And that was how I left the answer. That shut that down really quick. <clears throat> but, and, and uh, so, anyway, the, the point being that I think that <coughs> people my age, which is not super young anymore, we've never had to think about it the same way some of you guys have. You know, and I think that's because of some things that you guys have done and some of your predecessors have done. And I will say, too, <clears throat> I went to my first IWBC a couple years ago, and uh, my brass quintet was playing. We played a short recital, and um, there was nothing there that struck me as weird about me being there. It was the least competitive thing I've ever been around, the most supportive group of thing I've ever been around. I didn't feel like I was going to get hit by a double C assassin when I walked past any of the trade show tables. And... Um, I was like, oh, this is nice. It's nice to make double C's. And people are really nice. They make play phrases. It's different. So anybody that's a, a guy that's never been to one of those that thinks that's not really for them, it's it's quite the opposite. It's it's a really nice experience. So um, thank you guys so much for doing this. I want to ask one more question before you go, because uh, I know we've been on for a long time and you've been so patient. Uh, and you've had to be on screen the whole time, which means you couldn't like walk around and do anything. Um, so, uh, but I wanted to ask Amy to, to talk, you guys all talk about the new CD a little bit and, uh, where you can get it and, and where you can hear it and maybe just discuss how that came about. And then I'll, we'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop talking. Yeah. So this is our cover. It's called Scarpe. Um, you can find it on, um, CD baby, um, or iTunes, um, and Amazon music. Um, has it you can, for downloads and you can actually buy the CD from CD Baby if you're old, old school like I am and you got to have that CD in your hand. Um, it's called Scarpe, which is a piece that was written um, for us by one of Velvet's former uh, students, Drew Bonner. And Scarpe means uh, shoes in Italian. And so each movement is a different shoe. Um, so we, we've, we've got that on. We put on the La Fosse, which we fell in love with, um, the Sweet Impromptu, which is just an amazing piece. Um, and the Wilkie Renwick is on there. Uh, we did Duke Ellington Boy Meets Horn. There's the, 
the thing Velvet was talking about, how we try to, to mix that up. Um, Which uh, Amy sounds, and Velvet sound amazing on that. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Yeah. So that's that thing of listening and yeah. Um, you know, um, it was really fun for Velvet and I to do our little duet together in that, in that piece. Um, so we're really excited about it. It was, uh, we got together in, um, Alexander, Virginia and spent, um, two days of, I a day of just tweaking some things and then two days of, uh, recording for that. I think we're really excited about it. It's, it's, um, it was a lot of fun. Um, and, uh. Yeah, we, so. and, we, and we did that with our friend Chris Clark, who has his own production company. So he helped to serve as producer and editor and, and good set of ears. And uh, we really appreciate the time we spent with him. He was fantastic. He was. Yeah, he was great. We, and we loved the fact that he would go plane and because we were near the airport and we would have to stop till the plane cleared <laughs> and, and the sound of the plane. So. That was, it got to be quite funny to hear him come across plane and you just, everybody would just laugh and but it was some good lip breaks too, I think. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Uh, thanks so much for taking time out of your Monday nights during this busy pandemic season and or your Tuesday <laughs> night. And uh, I really appreciate you all being on. I appreciate what you do and what you've all contributed uh, individually and as a group. And uh, it's nice to meet a few of you, and it's great to see some of you guys again. And uh, just hang on a second. And, and I also want to thank my sponsor tonight, Euclid IQ, which is the world's leader in audio and video compression. And uh, I will see you all next week with a guest that I'll be announcing uh, very soon. So thanks a lot for watching, and have a great night. And thank you much for Stiletto Brass for being on. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.